When Louis Farrakhan hosted the Million Man March in 1995, just two weeks after the O.J. Simpson verdict, he was rising in influence because of his pro-family ideas that sought to restore pride and responsibility in black men. The event was predictably controversial, with some pissed off that women weren't the focus, and others, like Glenn Lowry, saying, if I could get a million black men together, I wouldn't march them to Washington, I'd march them into the ghettos. Skeptics claimed there would be violence, but between 400,000 to 800 37,000 black men peacefully converged on the National Mall on October 16, 1995, shattering racist expectations that the event would become violent or unruly. African Americans are sick and tired of being considered as the dregs of society, the buffoons, the shiftless, the lazy. Dear Lord, let the world know that all of our men are not incarcerated. Let the world know that all of our men are not white beaters. And we followed their journey to the nation's capital. I'm in awe of all the black men here, and it's true. Not all black men are in prison. Not all black men are selling dope. Not all black men are abandoning their children. The day was filled with speeches from prominent bipartisan leaders based on the themes of atonement, reconciliation, and responsibility to initiate spiritual healing and action. We want to let them know that the black contingent of men, women, and children have a significant vote in this country. This, is, this isn't about uh, Farrakhan, this is about respect, unity, and love for the brothers. And we're trying to get something out of this, out of life. We're tired of being behind everything. We want to be in charge sometimes. We want to unify, and that's what this is about. Unity. Look at all these brothers around here. We need to do and do it and show the government, hey, that we need, we need to have control of our destiny. There, Farrakhan, Marion Barry, Kurt Schmoke, Cornell West, Benjamin Chavis, Maya Angelou, and Rosa Parks voiced their most prominent concerns, including a poverty rate of over 40% and underfunded schools. At the time, over 11% of black men were unemployed, and for those aged 16 to 19, it was 50%. In addition to the swelling of the prison industrial complex, HIV AIDS was a growing problem too. It was spreading rapidly throughout the black community, and black people were becoming the majority of the new infections. In 1993, HIV was the leading cause of death among black men ages 25 to 44, and the second leading cause of death for black women in the same age range. Because of uh, the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers uh, today. LA Lakers star Magic Johnson revealed his positive diagnosis in 1991, and tennis star Arthur Ashe died from HIV AIDS complications two years later. In 1995, Easy e died of HIV AIDS. All of this prompted a black-focused HIV AIDS response, like a fall 1995 awareness concert by hip-hop artists like Biggie and salt and Peppa, and the 1998 creation of the Minority AIDS Initiative, which Clinton created to encourage HIV prevention in black communities. They were battling a culture of sexual repression that rejected sexual education, the prevalence of shared needles, and homophobic conspiracies that said HIV only impacted gay men. Keep in mind that at the beginning of the 90s, the revelations about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment were under 20 years old. These conspiracy theories reflected a distaste of mainstream media, as well as the consequences of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments and other examples of medical racism. For instance, a small but loud group of followers of Alfred Dr. Sebi Bowman, a Honduran herbalist who practiced in New York, believed that HIV AIDS and other illnesses could be cured with a special alkaline diet, despite all evidence to the contrary. Louis Farrakhan and other conservative black people tackled HIV by emphasizing the importance of black men practicing self-control and taking marriage seriously, while slipping in homophobic rhetoric as well. They also called for an end to violence and vulgarity. Everybody, not just gay people and women, were targets of criticism. Said Farrakhan at the Million Man March, every time we drive by shoot, every time we carjack, every time we use foul, filthy language, every time we produce culturally degenerate films and tapes, putting a string in our women's backside and parading them before the world, every time we do things like this, we are feeding the degenerate mind of white supremacy. 
Clearly, the black nationalism that Farrakhan, a Muslim man, promoted overlapped with the respectability politics of all black groups, regardless of political affiliation or religion. It affirmed white stereotypes of black people while simultaneously rejecting the proliferation of them and appealed to black Americans of all kinds who were tired of gang violence, men abandoning their children, and crime. Most importantly, Farrakhan's brand of black nationalism, though anti-Semitic and often misogynistic, also also laid blame for black issues at the feet of black men. He said during a 1994 tour, you're now doing the job for them, killing and maiming and destroying yourselves. In general, the blame for black misfortune was increasingly being placed not just on female-led homes, but on hip hop, whose biggest stars had lyrics and music videos laced with violence, drugs, and sex. 